briefly, I will just introduce Kim, who's clearly dying to get started. Um, many of you will know her as our wonderful webmaster. If you haven't yet looked at her own personal Bratton Cavelli One Place site, it's brilliant. Do go and have a look at some point. Um, she's the first of three of us today who are going to really give a bit of a case study as to what we've done with our One Place studies as regards World War One. And I'll, now I'll allow her to make a start. So would you like to welcome Kim to give her presentation? It's hard to be quiet. <laughs> and um, as my husband knows, and as he's lent me my watch, or his watch, um, He's aware that your uh, start of your lunch is in jeopardy with me. So. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, was, I was supposed to mention that. Sorry, that we we are all right to go on a little bit longer because our lunch is now on this floor and we haven't got to walk a long way to get it. So, um, just uh, first thing I'd like to say is thanks to all of you for coming today. It's so nice to put uh, names to faces. I'm sure I've talked with most of you over email, but I've really enjoyed meeting you all. Um, I'd also like to say uh, thanks very much to Phil and Kate. I've, I've really enjoyed your talks immensely. And I also have a special thanks for Susie, who has managed to schedule me right after Phil and Kate. So thank you for that, Susie. <laughs> I think it's probably that. my fault. I think I owe you one there. Uh, the other thing before we get started, I'd just like to say, don't worry about all this. If you need to get hold of me, just webmaster at oneplacestudies.org. Uh, we'll do it. Okay? Now, let's see how this uh, does today. <coughs> How's that? I want to introduce you to my place and for anybody here who sat through introductions to my place, which I love, uh, bear with me. So, Bratton Clovelly, not to be confused with Clovelly, uh, Devin, <laughs> is, uh, it sits, uh, oops, oh, I got this now. This is great. Okay. If I zap somebody, just let me know. <laughs> it sits right uh, west of Dartmoor, and um, Oakhampton, um, and is on a, this uh, really quite beautiful uh, plateau behind Dartmoor. So it's topped with a barrel of clay, so you really can't do too much out there except like raise sheep and cattle, which they've done, I think, since, you know, uh, like the Iron Age or something. Uh, but it's a really beautiful uh, piece of country. And uh, my very favorite place in it is up here. That is an 18th century survey map of Eastlake Farm. And in case anybody hadn't heard of Eastlake, that happens to be my grandmother's family. So this is the ancestral home of uh, my grandmother. Now, my family left there in the 1550s, uh, so I've got a little problem with researching much about them here. Uh, but, uh, but I'm interested in Bratton Crivelli through all time. It's just a wonderful place. And, uh, and I couldn't have been more pleased after about 400 years in the States that somehow when I discovered this was my grandmother's ancestral home, I was living one hour away in Taunton. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so Brent Clavelli is uh, all 50 farms. Uh, when the manor lands finally sold off in 1919, it probably bubbled up to about uh, 70 farms because they sold it off in 20 lights, lots, but big farms, 100 to 400 acres or so. It's got a beautiful village, and uh, you'd have to picture going down into this village. It's still, it's not far from a motorway, but you really can't get in there through the motorway. And you have to wind through these really ancient little lanes, and they've got these big steep banks that I think, um, I saw a time team thing, uh, <laughs> date probably from the Anglo-Saxon times. So you really feel like you're in this like timeless storybook place. Um, when you get in there, the first thing you see, oh, I've got to get used to this, sorry, is uh, St. Mary's Parish Church, which just kind of overlooks the whole little uh, village. Um, most of them now still uh, 19th century cottages, maybe 18th century, but uh, remnants of much older stuff. St. Mary's is a wonderful place. It's a little bigger than would be expected for a parish of, of um, this number of people, which has most of the time it's had about four to five hundred people throughout its history, kind of bubbled up in the early 1800s. Uh, but it's sprawling, it's 8,000 acres, so you've got a lot more cattle uh, than people here. But anyway, St. Mary's is a, is a very old church. You kind of cross a Christian doorstep and you come in and then you see the, uh, 
the Norman font over here. And in the 1990s, they took the whitewash on the lawn. They started peeling it back. And first they from the um, 17th century or so, kind of pure. So, then they peeled on back further, and they got back to medieval wall painting. So uh, you can't see them in entirety, but I've got a border set up down The only other thing I'd like to mention about the uh, the parish is uh, this is Everfield Manor. This was the last resident or the residence of the last lord of the manor. Um, he died and his wife died in 1913, and then the manor uh, lands fragmented for the last time in 1919. Now Eversfield was built in the early 19th century, and it's one of the most spectacular properties in West Devon. It's just sold for millions. It's only down to 11 acres now. It had 1,100 acres still when it sold in 1919. But uh, but I just want to tell you about this because this little uh, manor house uh, brought some fame. Uh, to my very quiet little village that really never makes the newspapers, or rarely. Um, when the story broke on Princess Diana and who, James uh, Hewitt, 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 Hewitt? Yeah, okay, guess where he was living. <laughs> <laughs> now, Frank Covelli has a church. It used to have a school. It used to have a post office. It's got an inn. So you can only imagine the media frenzy when this happens. So, uh, so there, he, there it is. Now, let's move on to the, uh, what I'm really going to talk about today is more about how I went about my study. I won't have time to go into uh, many of the soldier stories, but um, hopefully, um, I know for those of us who've gone and uh, joined the annual project all year, this is kind of the sequence we've used, but for those of you who still are going to get to your studies of the soldiers at a later time, hopefully this will be helpful. Simple plan, you know, find out who the guys were, try and put together their stories, um, try and characterize a little bit about them as a group, and then share and see what else I could find uh, from others. Your talk, Kate, was interesting, and I'm sorry I don't have a better picture. And in fact, this year, although, and my husband, Mark, uh, took the new photo, they've cleaned up the memorial, and the, and the names can be seen much better. There's only five names on this memorial. They have the rank, the name, the uh, regiment. Uh, but they've got that cleaned up, and that sits in a, on a little village green in front of the church. Uh, so it's a bit of a public area, but it's also the, the uh, in front of the church. Um, I think that that green's been a saw pit for a long time, but it's still about the most public area there is uh, in my uh, little parish. And uh, while I'm on this chart, I'd just like to thank Alex Coles, who ran our annual project, and she gave us prompts and tips all year long and ideas for how to progress this, and I, I personally found it really helpful. Um, but for anybody who's still going to continue these studies in the future, do go back and look what she's put out on the site and uh, in the uh, newsletters and hangouts about um, how to go about these things. So let's start with one name on the memorial, and that is Private Nicholas Palmer. I picked Nicholas for a reason. Better look at my watch. Uh, <laughs> and that is because there's still, and there's very few left, um, Mary Palmer, who's like the great niece of Nicholas, maybe, I think great niece, uh, still lives in the old post office in Brackenville Valley. And as I say, there's virtually no one with real tenure here, but Mary was postmistress from 1961 until the post office uh, closed, what, I don't know, a decade or so ago. And her family uh, were the postmasters and postmistresses since uh, the post office opened in the 1850s. So she's got three cottages together that, uh, that they really didn't own until the manor lands were sold off, but she's there. And every time you go to visit her, she just opens another drawer and kind of says, oh, look what I've got here. So it's just tucked all over her cottage. And she has just been very kind to us. So here's our fellow. Here's young uh, Nicholas. Look, I think these guys have been hunting. I don't really know exactly what they're holding. Uh, but um, but anyway, <laughs> is it rabbit? Yes. Oh, good. I'm glad you could figure that out. Uh, so do those look like good Devon boys there? So there's our Nicholas. Now, what are the sorts of places that I uh, went to uh, to get data on uh, Nicholas? Okay, here's his uh, baptism record, son of Nicholas and Agnes. 
guess what Nicholas, his father, did? Taylor and Postmaster, okay? Um, we can see him up here in the 1911 census with his brother John and his 82-year-old uh, <coughs> grandmother, Jane Nile Pierce. And um, they're, they're, the boys are both working as postmen. Uh, and in addition, um, you might notice uh, John is 35 years old in the 1911 census. Now all five of the Palmer boys served in the war, so John was serving really until about the age of 42. Uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about him uh, later. Here is uh, Nicholas's um, uh, medal card, and you can uh, see he was with the Duke of Cornwall. You probably can't see, but he was with the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, and he received the Victory Medal and the British War Medal. And Phil, I'll have to get uh, get an opinion from you on this, but this was the medal that uh, Mary had of Nicholas. And looking it up, it, it looks to me like it's the ribbon for the Victory Medal and the medal for the British War Medal. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's what you get with family mementos, right? That is definitely Nicholas's um, uh, medal that they've kept. And the other thing you can only barely see here, this says... Uh, he died for freedom and honor. It has his name, Nicholas Palmer. Mm -hmm. This was the memorial plaque given to next of kin uh, when they lost a, a loved one in the war. So uh, we've been re very lucky. I should have mentioned, too, this is uh, the announcement of his death in the local newspaper. So lots of sources for um, finding information. Obviously, on some of the other fellows, I don't have the uh, personal mementos, but um, but just look broadly. Uh, you'll find stuff in, in all kinds of places. Just to mention a couple other folks uh, that I found along the way, and I was actually looking uh, not only for all those who served, I kind of left it open. My parish is not big in terms of people, so I just went for any soldiers I could find. I've, I've focused on World War I, but I've got a booklet back there, and you'll see I, I, I was happy. I was picking up guys um, from the 1800s uh, up through World War II. But uh, f you'll find some good challenges along the way. This fellow, I saw the, uh, in the local newspaper, he received the Distinguished Service Medal uh, fighting in Gallipoli, and I went to figure out who he was. And I was clipping along and doing just fine until in 1911, I found him on two separate ships off the coast of Devon. <laughs> and, and I kind of went, okay, now, now get this, this is, now my little parish doesn't have people with the same names, okay, but we definitely did have here. Uh, so here we've got two fellows born within three months of each other, okay, both by William Parsons. Uh, both had parents, John, farm laborers. Um, they both uh, were right there in the Bratton Covelli area. What found me up is I wasn't seeing one of them because they were just slightly a few miles away and I wasn't picking them up in some of the local records. But they were both with their parents in uh, 1891. 1901, they were both working as farm laborers just outside Branca Valley. Uh, one enlisted as a boy sailor in 1902, one in 1904, both on ships off the coast of Devon in 1911. Both served 22 years and both became chief stokers. <laughs> so I think you'll find some really uh, interesting stories in here. And I thought you also might like this one. Uh, uh, there's some things you think maybe are modern day occurrences, uh, but uh, but don't be so sure, okay? He picked up some snipers out there in Gallipoli too, and they were dressed up. They turned out to be women, so uh, <laughs> so just keep an eye out for things like that. I'll also just mention you'll get some mysteries too. There are uh, probably about three people who I'm really not sure and haven't really been able to place who I found. But let me just mention Mary Jane Heath because she. She's really got me a little bothered. So Mary Jane, uh, born Mary Jane Shaw at Hague, uh, Hague Hall in Hague, Yorkshire. So you can guess this, this, this woman has probably uh, got a pretty nice lifestyle. Wife of Richard Heath. They were in Sussex and they moved into the old rec rectory in, Dome, in uh, Bratton Covelli in about 1903 and she was widowed by 1908. And she stayed in Bratton Covelli for another decade and Domans is really quite a nice quite a nice residence, as you might imagine. Both her daughters married in Brant Covelli. She shows up on the absent neighbor military uh, uh, voter list in 1918. Uh, no, in fact, uh, yeah, I think it is on that. It may be on the regular voters list because on the regular voter list they do identify 
absent naval or military voters, but on one of them she shows up and I'm thinking, what is it? She's back at Domans in 1919. She dies, now she was in her 60s then. She dies in Mary Tavy, right on the edge of Dartmoor, a few years later and leaves 10,000 pounds for her daughters. I talked to Alex about this and she said, well, maybe she was a nurse, but I have this real distinct feeling that this woman never worked a day in her life, you know. <laughs> so, so I don't know, I kind of got her more like, well, maybe she was a Mata Hari or something. I, I don't know, but, um, but anyway, you'll find some mysteries, so just keep an eye out for them. So I kept on with the, uh, with the data collection, and in the end I found 71 um, soldiers and sailors for, from a parish. Uh, 80% were resident in the parish when the war started. Uh, some others had been born there or married there, and then there were several I picked up because their parents were from there. This represented at least 60% of the fellows um, age 18 to 42 in the parish. Okay, And I would say this is an understatement because for some with common names, I couldn't absolutely distinguish um, you know, that they, their service record, and so I'm sure there were others who served and have actually found three since the time I compiled these statistics. So my suspicion is this is going to go up closer to 70% if I really had the full story. And I didn't even include Mary Jane in my statistics. So, uh, so anyway, it, it had a, it was massive. Mostly found, um, I found the best sources. You get information on them in the censuses and the, um, and the parish registers, but I probably only identified several new from those sources. My biggest sources were the voter list, including the regular and the absent voter list, and the local newspapers. Now, the local newspapers are great, and I sat through every one from 1910 to 1920. Every paper that said Grattan Clavelli, I looked at it, okay? You may get something, uh, most of the time, you'd either get Private Inn Palmer, and you'd go, well, who is that? <laughs> or you, I get, get a, got some who were mothers, okay, Mrs. Mountjoy's son was home on leave. Well, Mrs. Mountjoy had stepsons, so I didn't know that Mrs. Mountjoy's son didn't have the same name as her. So you have to do, um, do some tracking down, but you can get uh, stuff on the ones who became prisoners of war, the ones who got commissions or, or got uh, honors, um, uh, the ones, of course, who were wounded or died, and the ones on leave. So uh, those are terrific sources, and I would take the time to step through them. In addition, uh, you'll have loads of other sources for finding further information, and um, and that will depend a lot on where you guys were right before the war, as well as where they went after the war. Now I don't know where all my fellows went, but quite a few immigrated, and I won't really know till I do parish con reconstitution later where some of them ended up, but, uh, but um, there's a whole variety of, of sources. The other thing I checked out was this uh, medical status. So 18% of my fellows uh, uh, died, and uh, I think that's against about 13% uh, from a national average. I'm going to pick up more who died. Um, there's more information on the fellows who died. Um, so I think that probably explains uh, the anomaly, and it's a small sample size, but probably explains the anomaly. Um, another 10% were wounded and 14% had other medical conditions. Um, one typical one was the guys who went to the Middle East got dysentery. Okay, that would come up. Others had um, uh, uh, conditions that were aggravated uh, by uh, their war service. And when you look at the national statistics of about 25 or so percent wounded, I suspect that um, may be looking at both the wounded and, um, and other medical conditions, but I'll have to check that out. Bottom line is, though, not far off half of these guys had medical problems, were either died or had medical uh, issues, and these were healthy, healthy young men. So, so it's really quite shocking when you start to look at the numbers. Now what did I do next? I said I sat had this big spreadsheet where I thrown a row in uh, every time I found something on a guy. I said, how am I going to share this information? So I started to pull together stories. So here's Nicholas's story, and I got some of the the key dates up here and their service information. And uh, thank you for the picture of Time Cut because that is where Nicholas was buried, uh, where they were living in Bratcavelli and their relationship to the parish. And then I tried to find. 
uh, anything else I could find, I, I, I tried to put in kind of a narrative form because I had in mind I wanted to be able to hand this to somebody and say, hey, you know anybody who might know this guy or know something about this fellow? Uh, one only thing I'll mention, I won't go through uh, Nicholas's whole story, but um, he, I found, I think from a newspaper article that he was commemorated on a post office plaque. And I went over to, uh, Mark and I went over to Oakhampton and tried to find this post office plaque. And of course, I got down to the post office and it looked quite modern. And it had a little plaque that said, you know, in honor of World War I, but no name. So we said, hmm, you know where this might be? They sent us to the library. Well, it ended up, it was in this little museum of uh, Dartmoor life there in the uh, uh, in Oakhampton and uh, we had gone in and the people at the front desk didn't have a clue what was in that museum and we wandered around the whole thing and right at the end down in a dark corner at the bottom of the step was the big post office plaque and it had um, it had Nicholas at the top but it also had a bottom part of those who served and that had his brother John uh, on that part too so it's just a wonderful find so uh, we put together stories and tried to keep reasonable track of the sources um, for, uh, for these soldiers. And what I did, and I've put one of these on the table now, is uh, I put that together in a, uh, a booklet. And actually, this is, uh, so all these stories of these guys are in here. And I say there's only about three we couldn't really track down. Uh, there's also information on fellows from World War II, uh, because some of them, three of my guys served in both wars. And there's also some on the fellows from 1800. And in fact, I just threw in all but the kitchen sink, so I even have the 1569 muster roll in here. So, uh, <laughs> so you can take a look. And this is available on my website, or you can um, get a hold of me if you want. It's just a PDF copy. But I was able to take this to the parish then and leave it with them and say, okay, if anybody has any information, let me know. Now for the... Uh, uh, we ran a few simple analyses. And again, I've got another booklet back there that says... Ideas for analyzing military data. So it's just some starter ideas on, you know, ages at death. Um, it shows a couple of the guys who died later after the war, things like that. But um, you might want to take a look. And again, if anybody, you know, uh, really likes this kind of stuff, which I love this kind of stuff because I'm, I'm an IT type. But um, um, just let me know and you're welcome to that. But just a couple of um, things here. Um, Birth year, as I said, uh, I 1876 to 1901 was the years I checked. Now, a couple of other, you know, old salts who've been in the military long before, but 1876 to 1901 were people who joined up uh, uh, in World War I for the first time. Um, average age, obviously, went up at the end. Service regiment, okay, Phil, there's our Devonshire regiment. A lot of the fellows, now the next line is Royal Navy, because... The farmers didn't just go into the British Army. Uh, this one I loved, and you won't, say, as I say, there, it's in the booklet, but I looked at the occupation of the people they were raised by as well as their own occupation, if they were old enough to have one. Very egalitarian, okay, this, this caught everybody, okay. There's farm laborers, farmers, schoolmasters, clergy, uh, everybody was involved in this. And the other thing um, I did was I had, uh, that doesn't show up well, from the 1845 tithe map, I had derived a map of all my um, farms and stuff, and I just placed the residence of, residences of the guys who went into World War I on that. And again, you can see it, uh, it's all over the parish. The little cluster in the center is Bratton Village, which about 20-25% of the folks live in. Uh, but I found that really interesting, and you can also guess that of the farms that didn't send soldiers, they may well have been the families of the spouses of those uh, soldiers because, um, you know, a lot of them would have married right in the uh, parish. I'm close. Okay, now for the really fun part. This is a really rewarding part. Um, was really sharing all along, as I said, uh, for those of you who didn't participate in the uh, project, check out the forum. There was discussions throughout the year that Alex was um, prompting us with. We also had several um, hangouts, and Alex led a few that were quite excellent. But then she got in Susie Grogan, who studied mental illness in World War I. And for any of you who haven't seen that, that's on our YouTube uh, site. You really ought to. It's really interesting. And Susie has just recently published a book. Um, I think it's called Shell Shock. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very, very good. Um, 
in addition, I have my own site, so I put the uh, records up. So I have like World War I, Roll of Honor, those who served in World War I to II, and I have those available on my site. And I started, did a little blog and put my little booklet um, up and made that available and was just asking if people could get in touch if they knew uh, folks. And, um, and, uh, and I'll show you what we came up with. So I got, can you believe these guys? These are young soldiers and they died within six months of each other in World War I. I got contacted by a fellow in South Australia who sent me this book, Farmers, um, Devon to South, South Australia. This family, uh, John Rundle, who sent me this, uh, uh, was a descendant of a couple who left Branton Clavelli in the latter 1800s with their five children and immigrated to South Australia. And they had farms out there. I was telling it to some people earlier this morning. They named one farm Bratton. They named one farm Holesworthy, which is another good Devon, mm -hmm. West Devon name. Uh, but anyway, John sent this and asked me to deposit it with um, Tavistock Museum and Museum of um, uh, Dartmoor Museum, um, but I think I'm going to get them to send me another because I'm not giving up mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to get it down to the Devon Record Office. It's wonderful. But I just want to, so, so uh, Lynn and Ellis both died. They were first cousins. They were the first generation born in, um, in South Australia. And I just want to read what you might find if you share what you found, you know, what you might find in return. It is understood that Henry Ellis's father returned to the house soon after Ellis's death and announced Ellis has gone. The family could not understand how Henry came to that understanding. Nevertheless, this prepared them for some time later when a rider on a white horse approached the farm as was customary for the local policeman when delivering news of the soldier's death. So um, I just would really encourage y'all. Sorry, I think these guys are beautiful young men. But, um, but anyway, um, so uh, very rewarding to share. In addition, and this one even gets a little bit better. Okay, so uh, we're over at Mary's one day, and she's rifling through and pulling out. And says, oh, here's an autograph book. Okay, now this autograph book had entries up to about 1914-15. Started throwing something through it, and I saw these sketches and, and poems and stuff. And, the, uh, and I was recognizing some of the soldiers. I'm recognizing the names of the soldiers we've been finding. And I said, well, what is this, Mary? And she said, this was the autograph book of Edith, Nicholas's sister, who was a teenager at the time, so she would have known all these boys. On the very last page, there was this picture, and it's a Navy officer, if you, you can look at it, putting the ring on the finger of a girl. And it's signed A. Bowles. Well, Arthur was on the Breton. Uh, Clavelli World War One Memorial. So he uh, he died on the Somme on first of July. His picture had been stuck in the book later, and it had a poem that Edith has written uh, about him. And it turned out she was his sweetheart. Uh, Mary went on to tell me that uh, Edith, uh, a few years after the war, had an illegitimate child. She stayed there at the post office where Mary's still living today, and she died in the 1990s. So. If you want to uh, find information, be sure and get what you find out so that others can see it, because otherwise you will have no idea about this sort of thing. Is it done? No, and, um, you know, <laughs> never is. Um, very excited about the World War I unit diaries. I've seen them for some. Cannot wait. Hope some, some of you have probably dug into those. Uh, incredible records. New officer records out. We've got some really interesting officers in my parish, and I'm going to find out about their careers now. Um, more to learn about the Devonshire Regiment, and I showed one of the books. I went down to the Keep, uh, and I would recommend that you check out your regimental museum if you're able to, and they had a wonderful three-volume set on the history of the Devonshire Regiment, uh, which uh, really, um, uh, I don't know, Phil, you said some of them were a little weaker, but the uh, Devonshire Regiment's been around a very long time, and I think even those original musters and militias guys uh, kind of uh, fed into that. Uh, mentioned, got tra immigrants to track down, because these guys did, a lot number immigrated, and then to take a closer look at World War II, because I've gotten a start on that. So I take a good few years, but I am retiring in two months, and I can't wait to get on. <laughs> Just to finish, um, 
take the time to get to know these guys' stories. It's very moving. I'm sure you'll find it very rewarding. And, um, uh, and you're going to find some really interesting stories that will uh, just move your heart. Because this is personal to me, I will never miss out the opportunity of, uh, of my own family. And uh, I just want to show you a couple things that as you go dig into your parishes, don't forget that you've been entrusted with things too uh, that future OPSers may be um, interested in. For example, this is the bosun's whistle of a boy sailor who uh, climbed up to the crow's nest faster than anybody else and spent 40 years aboard Royal Navy submarines. And I've just got one more, if I can do it without crying. <laughs> <laughs> Or you might have the flag given to the next of kin in a military burial. So take good care of them and enjoy your study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. That was amazing. I don't think I'm going to be the only one who's going to be, should we say, borrowing some of your ideas. <laughs> and I know, Kim said, she'd be more than happy to share what she's done and how she's done it with, with anybody who's, who'd like to ask her. We've got time just for a couple of questions. If anyone would like to ask something. They're all thinking like They're all thinking like <laughs> Kim is here. Oh, hang on. Oh. It isn't actually a question, it's just a comment. Um, you talk about finding um, information in strange places. Um, the second cousin of my wife has inherited uh, a load of family archive, which includes um, the correspondence between her great uncle and his fiancée, later his wife. Yeah. Um, which went on from 1913 right through to the end of the war. Um, he served at Los and the Somme and Bum and Hamel and various other places. But he is now publishing that on the internet as a blog with each of the love letters being posted 100 years to the day after they were written. Uh, and it, it shows not just their personal relationships, but it actually is forming a complete story of what things were like um, where Arthur was um, in some cases um, how military operations went ahead um, I wouldn't have had any idea how they um, uh, protected the railway from Winchester to Andover in the weeks before the beginning of the war if we've not had those records all kinds of strange things can come out of personal letters so look for Absolutely them agree. thank you very much anyone else right well in that case i think oh kirsty's waving no, so i just need to say something for lunch Say thank you, and then I'll do my best. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Can we please thank Kim once again for our excellent presentation? <laughs>